Welcome to this virtual event on connecting international humanitarian law and the women, peace and security agenda. I'm Milan Brevere, the director of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security. We're so pleased to be co-hosting this event today with the government of the Principality of Liechtenstein and its Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Justice and Culture. We are joined by more than 700 participants uh, across many time zones and 90 countries. And we welcome each and every one of you today to this discussion. Before we begin the program, a logistical note. Although we have already received many pre-submitted questions from our audience, know that you can also submit your questions throughout the program by using the Q&A function on your computer and just state your name, organization, and to whom you are directing your question. One additional note, tune in to the second season of our podcast, Seeking Peace, which explores the ways that women around the world are bringing lasting peace to their communities. You can listen to Seeking Peace on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or at seekingpeacepodcast.com. And now a little background on our discussion today. Last week, we marked Human Rights Day and today we are focusing on the linkages between the women, peace and security approach and international human rights law. There is growing attention to the ways in which conflict disparately affects women, both civilians and combatants. UN Security Council Resolution 1325 and the subsequent resolutions in support of the WPS agenda have placed the protection of women in armed conflict, particularly conflict-related sexual violence, as well as women's participation of peace, in peacemaking on the international agenda. So those twin pillars under 1325, protection, participation. International humanitarian law is the body of law regulating armed conflicts and the trigger for the application of IHL is the existence of armed conflict. While recognizing that war is undesirable, IHL holds that conflicts must be fought within certain legal bounds and seeks to provide protection to both combatants and civilians from the worst excesses of violence. IHL is integral to the WPS agenda. The Security Council resolution that established the Women, Peace and Security framework has repeatedly referenced international humanitarian law, calling upon member states to uphold the Geneva Conventions and additional protocols and to condemn violence against women and girls as violations of international humanitarian law. Yet it is noteworthy that the potential synergies between international humanitarian law and women, peace and security have not been well explored, either by advocates or by scholars. Although WPS and IHL differ in terms of focus, scope, legal force, the research policy brief that we are releasing today, thanks to the Principality of Liechtenstein shows that there are key commonalities, particularly when considering questions of women's protection and participation. These commonalities present opportunities, both to the Women, Peace and Security agenda to improve the compliance of IHL by armed actors and to use the humanitarian law to strengthen the Women, Peace and Security implementation efforts. This event will introduce the preliminary findings of a research initiative that is exploring the synergies between Women, Peace and Security and IHL and documenting how women's participation in state armed forces relates to combat decisions and the propensity to violate the international humanitarian law. You can find the brief on our website 
and the actual link is on the chat. In the next phase of the research, the research team will investigate the effects of women's participation in national militaries on strategic and tactical decision-making and use, use both qualitative and quantitative methodologies to study how organizational cultures, structures, and decision-making processes within state militaries influence decisions to deploy troops, to use force, and to select targets. Our esteemed panel that will join shortly will have much more to say on this, but this is to set the background for this discussion today. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Ambassador Christian Vennewasser, who is permanent representative of Liechtenstein to the United Nations, a post he has held for several years. He has a very distinguished diplomatic career. The rule of law and the protection of fundamental rights have been guiding priorities in Liechtenstein's foreign policy. They have been committed to the advancement and better application of international law and especially human rights as today's event and this research project indicate. Liechtenstein has been globally recognized for its commitment and leadership in this area. And I just wanna make a personal note about Liechtenstein because it has also had a very strong commitment to women's rights for which I know we are all grateful. So Mr. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Beer, for your for your great introduction. It's a it's a real pleasure um, for me for me to be here today with you. And thanks uh, everybody who has joined us uh, in impressively large uh, numbers. Um, we are very excited uh, to be able to to launch uh, this study today, and I very much look forward um, to our panelists. Um, I think you have said. Uh, the most important things in your in your introduction, but let me just let me just emphasize um, that uh, we are very excited about this project as it as it brings together two longstanding priorities of our um, foreign policy. Um, that is the women, peace, and security agenda, and uh, our strong commitment uh, uh, to um, to international humanitarian law and our efforts to try to uh, in, uh, to enhance compliance with that uh, body of law which has been um, increasingly problematic in the in the last few years now this obviously is a is a pivotal and and the big year for the women peace and security agenda everybody in this uh, call um, knows this uh, 20 years ago uh, resolution um, 1325 uh, was adopted by the Security Council, a landmark decision, uh, not just for this agenda, I believe, but really for the thematic work of the Security Council um, overall. It is one of the, I think, most quoted um, Security Council resolutions and one that has had the strongest uh, impact and follow up in uh, the Council, uh, but also outside and in, in the field. Um, at the same time, implementation leaves a lot to be uh, to be desired, and um, you know the anniversary that we're commemorating this year is not so much just an opportunity to celebrate, but a moment for us to think about what we can do to take this agenda forward. And we have always had um, a strong uh, inclination to focus on the participation um, pillar of the Women, Peace, and Security agenda. Um, which is a which is reflected in the in in the project that uh, that yeah, we will be uh, talking about today. So we thought it would be uh, extremely important to explore and better understand the impact of the participation of women in military armed forces on compliance with international humanitarian law, taking into account uh, the several dimensions and aspects um, leading uh, to that. We are very, very happy to have um, uh, found an excellent uh, partner in the Georgetown Institute um, in assisting our endeavors uh, in this respect. Uh, the Institute has uh, developed a very persuasive research proposal uh, using a comparative approach that you will be hearing about uh, 
from the uh, uh, co-authors uh, directly uh, in uh, in a in a few minutes. We have committed to supporting this uh, project uh, this year and in 2021 as part of our uh, multilateral development cooperation uh, activities. Uh, we do hope that uh, this event uh, will generate a lot of interest on the part of others and we will find also partnerships in taking this uh, further forward and uh, that is certainly one of the one of the purposes we're pursuing we, we are pursuing uh, by having um, this um, event today so really i just want to conclude uh, by by thanking uh, the georgetown institute for the excellent work that they have done i very much look forward uh, to hearing um, to hearing the presentations of the panel, and thanks again uh, to everybody who has uh, joined us for the conversation today. Well, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, and thank you, most importantly, for Liechtenstein's leadership uh, in this area. We're very, very grateful, and and really grateful that you could join us. I'm going to turn now to uh, Jenny Klugman, uh, who is the managing director at the institute and ha who has been leading our team of researchers on this work. Uh, she will introduce our exceptional panel of experts. So Jenny, it's all yours, please take it away. Thanks Milan uh, and thanks Mr. Ambassador and thanks to all of you who have joined us here today. We have a great lineup kicking off with highlights from the new research and then turning to our august panel for their reflections and responses to key questions. I will introduce the panelists in turn just before they present. We'll begin now uh, with the emerging findings about the gaps and potential synergies between IHL and WPS, building on some of the themes that uh, Milan Ambassador Vivi has already introduced. So Orly Stern will walk us through the highlights of the research brief that she co-authored with me and my colleagues at Georgetown, Mara Rivkin at the Law School and Rob Nagel, who's with us at the Institute. And you can find a link to the actual paper in the chat box. So about uh, Orly Stern, Dr. Stern is a visiting fellow of practice at the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford University. We were very happy when she agreed to work with us on this project uh, because all these an authority on international law, on gender and security, and particularly in countries affected by conflict and instability. Uh, she has a PhD in law from the LSE and a master's in international human rights law from Harvard. So over to you, Orly. Uh, you have about 15 minutes to present and then we'll go to our panel. Thanks. Oh, can you hear me now? Good morning. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, depending where you're calling in from. Um, I'm calling today from Cape Town, South Africa. And as was said, I will brief you, I'll walk you through, through some of the key findings from the study. So as the people introducing today have mentioned, international humanitarian law and women, peace and security are intrinsically related. International humanitarian law lies at the very heart of, of the women, peace and security agenda by, by um, regulating the protection of women in conflict. But although they have a great deal of links, the links between them and the mechanisms by which they could be connected have been not been studied before and have, are not very well understood. So what we tried to do in this project was to start looking at the ways in which these two quite different bodies um, could relate to each other and could actually help each other, could actually um, each work to support the implementation of the other. Let me briefly start by just Talk, um, for those non-specialists on the call, briefing you, uh, walking you through the two bodies that we're talking about before I talk about the intersections between them. So as I'm sure many of you know, international humanitarian law are the laws of war. These are the laws that regulate the conduct of facilities. They regulate what people can and can't do when they're fighting conflicts. And they recognize that although conflicts are, uh, although wars will happen and conflicts are terrible, conflicts should be fought within certain bounds. There should be some limits to what people fighting conflicts can do. And so these set out the limits uh, on what fighting parties are able to do in conflict. Now, they're, they're, they're based on, they have very various rules within these, but there's three core principles that make up international humanitarian law. 
One is the principle of distinction, and that talks about needing to distinguish between combatants and civilians, and only being able to target civilians, not being able to, uh, sorry, only being able to target combatants, not being able to target civilians or civilian property. The second principle is proportionality, which talks about the need to make sure that attacks are proportionate to the anticipated military goal. And the third principle is necessity. The attacks that are done in a, made in a war should be necessary, should serve some military necessity purpose. They shouldn't, uh, attacks that are not militarily necessary should not be allowed. So that's international humanitarian law. Now this is actually a very gendered body of law. Although the law is on the face of it, formally, uh, formally equal, it, it goes towards a, mo a model of formal equality. If you look deeper into the law, you can see that the law is actually highly gendered. It's based on quite a lot of very old fashioned notions about women being victims and in need of protection in war and about men being um, combatants and perpetrators in war. Um, and so these, these um, gendered understandings fuse the body of law and have definitely fused the way in which the law has been understood. The Women, Peace and Security Agenda has been a series of Security Council resolutions that started off in the year 2000 with Security Council Resolution 1325. And what these resolutions did was they put for the uh, they created for the first time ever in the at the highest international level a uh, international political recognition of the fact that gender was a material factor in peace and security. Gender wasn't just an irrelevant factor in conflict; it's a highly, highly relevant factor in the ways that security issues play out and manifest. Now, as was mentioned, the security the Women, Peace and Security Agenda is founded on a number of pillars. These are participation and prevention, protection, and recovery and relief. But as was mentioned earlier, the protection pillar and the participation pillar have been the two pillars that were really focused, uh, that have really been focused on. And we think these are the two pillars that really um, give us a lot of potential to link IHL and the Women, Peace and Security agenda. Let me quickly pause to tell you about how we, um, how we um, start, how we worked on this piece of research and what our methodology was. So because there was very little actual research looking at the comparison between women, peace and security and international humanitarian law, what we did was we looked at the various component issues that were related to this, part, um, to this topic. So in keeping with the participation focus in women, peace and security, we looked at the issue of participation of women in state militaries. And, the, and this project really focused on, on women in state militaries, as opposed to women's participation in the various other forums that the women, peace and security provides for. So we looked at the participation of women in armies and we looked at a number of different issues. We looked at the numbers of women. We looked at whether women are holding senior ranks or not senior ranks. We looked at the way that women are being used in military decisions, in, in targeting decisions, in the decisions around whether IHL is being um, applied or not. And we looked at the different mechanisms that might vary the way in which women, um, military decisions were made. We looked at um, questions about, is there a, a particular number of women that you need to have in a military to to tilt it, to change the, the likelihood that women's voices will be heard in a different way. We looked at issues about, um, do you need women in leadership? And what are the roles uh, that leadership needs to do to try and enhance the voices of women and, try, and to try and change the effect that having women in these spaces might have? So that was sort of the one area we looked at. And then we looked at the link between that and international humanitarian law. So we looked at whether militaries are keeping international humanitarian law or whether they're violating it. And we tried to link that. Is there a relationship between countries that have more women in the militaries and in military decision-making roles and between the extent to which they violate international humanitarian law or not? We looked at sexual violence, both perpetrated by soldiers against civilians, as well as perpetrated within national militaries. And again, we sought to question, is there a relationship between the number of women that you have and the roles that you have of, of the women take and the, and the extent to which um, these types of sexual violations are being perpetrated? So we looked at a number of different issues that we saw as being relevant to, to, the, um, to, the, to the relationship between these bodies. But in addition to looking at the issues, we also looked at three really fascinating case studies. And these case studies were each selected because of the fascinating dynamics that the um, different dynamics that each highlight and each tell us about. Now, the one case study was South Africa, where I'm calling in from today. And South Africa was chosen for a number of reasons. First of all, it's got the highest proportion of women of any military in Africa at, 20, at around 
Second of all, and very sadly, the South African military is, has allegations against sort of immensely high levels of sexual violence uh, on deployment as well as within its ranks. So the, um, they, they, they're implicated in, in many, um, in sexual exploitation and abuse and in, and in rape and in sexual, um, sexual assault within the military. Now, one of the things that we were thinking about is the way in which these different armies are deployed. And the South African army was a very interesting example because the South African uh, military is first of all, very often deployed in UN peacekeeping operations across the African continent. And what's been really troubling is the amount of allegations that have been made against the South African army for, for, for perpetrating sexual exploitation and abuse while on deployment and for raping while on deployment, which in itself would be a violation of IHL uh, in situations where IHL is applicable. The South African military is also sometimes deployed internally. So just recently this year, we had the South African military deployed as part of the COVID lockdown response. And a few years ago, we had the South African military deployed as part of fighting gangsterism in the ganglands. So there've been some interesting internal deployments. And what this got us thinking about was what we call the blind spots in IHL. As, you, um, as the IHL practitioners in the call will know, IHL is a body of law that applies when, when there's a state of armed conflict. And the trigger for the application of, of IHL is the existence of an armed conflict. But what we see here is a number of different situations where the military is deployed, but where it's not an armed conflict. And so you don't have this crucial regulating body, IHL, which is the main regulating body for regulating truth behavior. You have it not applying because you're not, you don't have a conflict situation. So um, the South African example really made us start thinking about this problem of these blind spots. Our next case study was the USA, another really fascinating um, example in the dynamics that it illustrated. Again, it's another army that's got quite high levels of women. The rates of women vary across the various branches within the military. So you've got around 8% in the Marine Corps, you've got over 19% in both the Navy and the Air Force. Again, you've got this very troublingly high level of sexual um, assaults and it, um, it happening within the military. And this is often sexual assault, assaults happening within the military. So service members against service members. So these are just a couple of statistics we found. In 2013, it was estimated that at least 25% of service members have been sexually assaulted and 80% have been sexually harassed. And interestingly, this is not just against women. Um, it's a, an average of 10,000 US um, male service members are sexually assaulted in the military every year, um, making it about 4% of all male service members. And we also thought that the US was a really interesting example because of its um, interesting relationship with international humanitarian law. Um, and many of you on the call will know about this, but certainly around the time in 2001 where the global quote unquote war on terror was declared, um, US um, compliance with IHL eroded to, um, to quite an extent where the State Department's Office of the Legal Counsel um, came up with quite creative interpretations of IHL to try to justify the government's um, efforts to circumvent international humanitarian law. And so what you got around the time of the US invasion in Afghanistan, the Bush administration were making a number of arguments about the fact that IHL did not apply to Taliban fighters or to um, Al Qaeda personnel or to what they called enemy, enemy combatants. There were some interesting issues arising around Guantanamo Bay, which is um, and about arguments made about the fact that IHL did not apply um, to, to what was happening at Guantanamo Bay. And interestingly, Guantanamo Bay was chosen as a, as a site for a prison deliberately to avoid jurisdiction of the law. So again, this got us thinking about these blind spots, these places where soldiers are deployed, where they have power, and yet where IHL either doesn't apply or where arguments are made that it didn't apply. The final um, example that we looked at was the situation was, was Israel. It's another interesting situation, first of all, because they've got the highest number of female um, soldiers of any country in the world sitting at around 50%. One of the reasons is because there's compulsory con um, conscription in Israel for both men and women. And you've also got, um, in recent years, seen quite a, 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 a lot more women um, being used in combat positions. So um, in, oh, it was only in 1995 when women started being used in combat, and today you've got more than 2,500 women working in combat. You started to see in Israel more women in leadership positions, in the positions of battalion commander um, and, 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 and colonels. But what you still don't see is women in the very, very highest levels in the military. And women in leadership of the military and, and women in combat in Israel is very important, as this has often been a, a, a lead in to women having political power in the country more broadly. So, one of the things that people need to get 
to, to rise to the highest levels in politics is a combat history. So this issue of women in combat has been a really um, interesting issue there and an important issue. So very briefly, I, I, um, I can't tell you much about our findings. You're gonna to need to read our report for that, which we're very excited for you to all read. But I'll just run you through a couple of thoughts about the, um, the key findings that we found. And what we found was that it was really a, a, in the participation pillar and the protection pillar that we started seeing the most room for the intersection between women, peace and security and international humanitarian law. Now, first of all, participation seemed to us to be the, the key area where this link could be drawn. And, um, and, this, and this real mechanism where having more women involved could be seen as a way to enc encourage um, an increase in IHL compliance. Now, one of the things that our study found was that there's accumulating evidence, both from the military as well as from business and a whole bunch of other bodies of literature around how having more women in a decision making space and in fact having more diversity in people in a decision making space actually leads to better decisions. So if you have a more diverse team rather than just men or rather than just one particular type, more diversity in a team uh, leads to better decisions. And we, we, we really backed this up from literature from a number of different sources. And we looked at the modalities. We looked at why is it that um, more diversity in a team leads to better decisions. And we really explored the reasons for that. But what, what was very clear is that the literature is clear about the fact that the more diversity you have, the more um, the better decision making seems to be made. And we would therefore argue that better decision making equates to better IHL compliance because, because there's a lot of reasons why it makes sense for countries to comply with IHL. If a country, for a few reasons, if a country complies with IHL, it's more likely that their enemies in war will comply with IHL and that their own civilian population will not be harmed. If a country complies with IHL, they'll have more legitimacy in the international arena. They'll be less likely to have condemnation and, and um, prosecutions. There's a number of reasons why strategically it makes sense for countries to comply with IHL and why we think that, that would therefore be an example of good decision making. And so linking the two together, if good decision making is IHL compliance and diversity leads to good decision making, we think that that really bolsters the call in women's peace and security agenda for getting more women in the space and for getting more women in leadership positions and at all stages, because it will ultimately help to get better decision in the space. We did want to note, though, that one thing that we did, we, we felt needed more research is this question of would women in the high levels of the military make different decisions to men? So we're sort of uh, often there's an assumption made that women would make different type of decision. But if a woman had been in the military for 20 or 30 years and had worked up the ranks and had lived a military lifestyle, would she in fact make decisions in a different um, way to men? There's a big question mark there. And we think that that would be a very interesting, that, that is a very interesting area for potential future research. And then the protection um, uh, pillar. This is another area where we see those two links happening. And, um, and the first thing I want to, the, um, so, sorry, the, the protection area is another really interesting um, way in which these links can. And there's a few reasons for this. The first thing is that the Women, Peace and Security agenda has often really focused on the protection of women against sexual violence. The agenda has had a real conflict related sexual violence focus. And what's the, the agenda has been criticized often for its real over focus on this and often neglecting the other areas, the other places where women have a, a, a risk in conflict. Now, we think that if the Women, Peace and Security agenda would more often highlight the, um, the need for compliance with IHL, increased compliance with IHL would actually lead to more safety for women. So if people are keeping the principle of distinction, if people are making attacks which are proportional and not having disproportionate civilian targets, if people are restricting their attacks to, uh, to, to attacks that are militarily ne uh, necessary, increased IHL compliance will lead to more protection for women. So this is something which very much bolsters the goals of the Women, Peace and Security. They share those goals. Um, we also think that it can work in the other direction. And um, we think that in when people are talking about IHL violations, they could also bolster those claims by referencing women to peace and security agenda. So if you think about one example, um, it, in despite a large number of allegations of, of IHL violations in, in Yemen, such as indiscriminate to bombings of civilians, sexual violence, arbitrary detention, torture. Despite all of these ITL violations, many of, most, many of which were against women, 
The panel of experts in Yemen's final report in, in 2020 only made one re reference to the women peace and security agenda. So we think that so too in the, those things which are criticizing IHL violations could also make reference to, to women peace and security agenda to, to bolster it in the, in the other direction. So the calls for compliance on both sides could bolster the calls for compliance on the other. Just to link back to this blind spots issue, which we found so interesting, um, we were really troubled by this issue of the blind spots, this, this question of like this, the many situations where soldiers are being deployed, but where IHL, which is this primary regulating body for military behavior, is just not applicable. And we thought that um, women, peace and security could be a really useful opportunity to, to help us in these moments of blind spots. Women, peace and security agenda is not limited in the same way as IHL is to moments of formal armed conflict. It applies prior to armed conflict, it applies post conflict, it applies in a wider array of times. And what's important to say is that feminist scholars for years have been talking about the fact that the dangers to women don't start the moment that a war is, uh, begins and end the moment that a peace treaty is signed. The, the dangers to women often start before and linger way after. There's, there's not these sharp threshold moments as you have in IHL. Now we think that linking women, peace and security to international humanitarian law can again help us here um, by linking the two and by constantly referencing IHL um, within a women, peace and security and IHL compliance within there, you could really um, find a way, to, you could use that as a way to extend those protections both before and after, which will um, to some extent get us around those blind spots when it comes to the protection of women. And then a final slide for me before we hand over to the policy. Uh, so before we hand over to the panel, we think there's some really interesting policy implications here. And we think there's some really interesting moment, um, ways in which um, these findings, which are spelt out in far more detail in the report, can be used by a number of different types of actors to further bolster the relationship between these bodies. So on the one hand, we think that on the formal global arena, the, uh, the political bodies at the, at the top of the global um, a, a political arena, such as the Security Council, we think that both need to be referencing both violations and compliance with IHL and Women, Peace and Security and together to, to sharpen this link between them. We think that the international tribunals um, in both their arguments as well as in their judgments, we think that um, the arguments that are made before the tribunals can speak to the changing norms around protection by referencing the woman peace and security agenda. So that, that too comes into the, the, the work of the tribunals. Um, we think that at the multilateral level, we know that in the UN there's already been a large commitment to increasing the number of women in various different bodies of the UN and at various different levels. But one of the ways, the things that we think would be good is in tracking these efforts, in tracking the results of having this higher number of women, if we can track IHL violations as one of the, as one of the indices to see whether the, um, having so many women is actually playing a role. And then finally, just to talk about the critical role of civil society and academia and activists in all of this. I mean, the, the work that activists have done in recent years around women, peace and security agenda has been phenomenal. And we think that it can really fall on activists to bolster the links between these two and to add calls for IHL compliance to the women, peace and security calls. And there's ways in which we can facilitate this. One of the things which we notice is that often activists in the women, peace and security agenda simply don't have the knowledge and the tools around women, peace and, um, around international humanitarian law. So we could be thinking about things like training for women, peace and security activists on IHL. And we could think about like uh, monitoring tools on international humanitarian law violations as they relate to women that women, peace and security activists can, can use. So yeah, that's just a little tidbit of some of the many, many findings that we found. There's loads more to read in the report and we're really looking forward to sharing that with you. So with that, let me hand over to, um, to the rest of the panel. Thank you. Thanks very much, Orly. Uh, you had an unenviable job, but uh, thanks for uh, highlighting those, those findings. Um, I should note that in addition to the research brief, um, uh, we also have a longer res uh, uh, research paper, which will become available in January. And that includes much more detail on the, uh, on the um, on the case studies uh, and more on the policy implications. So let me turn now to Helen Durham, uh, who's Director of International Law and Policy at the International Committee of the Red Cross. 
Uh, Dr. Durham is an international humanitarian lawyer uh, with many years of experience with the Red Cross as well as with the ICRC. Uh, she's worked in the field in multiple countries, including in Myanmar, in the Philippines, and various parts of the Pacific. Uh, she's taken part in international treaty negotiations, and she's very widely published on topics related to women and armed conflict. Helen. Uh, the ICRC is very much on the front lines of humanitarian responses to conflict and often calling out actions and parties which breach international law and norms. What do you see as the key strengths and weaknesses of international humanitarian law in preventing and responding to these transgressions which are way too often experienced by women amidst conflict? And how could the synergies with the WPS agenda be more fully pursued? Helen, over to you. Oh, well, thank you very much, Jen Jenny, and thank you for all the ambassadors of that fantastic walkthrough of this exciting piece of research. I'm delighted both in my professional capacity, but also in my personal capacity, having spent a couple of decades working on this issue, that we can bring ourselves closer together, the, the WPS and the IHL agenda. So I wanted to start off on that, so many thanks. Um, I thought in perhaps when you asked me the questions, reflecting on two strengths um, of IHL and then look at two connections, but I think as many of the speakers have already articulated in this session, um, IHL has a very particular time frame, a particular need for its entry into force. I would love to have a debate maybe at the end about these blind spots, because certainly from an ICRC perspective and working with 20,000 colleagues all over the world in world zones, it's the interface between the human rights normative framework and IHL coming together that often provides a, a patchwork to allow us to deal better with the protections of women. So whilst um, IHL of course has blind spots and, and sometimes people have said in the past it was a, an area of international law written by men, for men, about men, um, I've certainly found in my own experience though it has a, a significant range of protections for women if we use them correctly and they're very clearly articulated. But I think some of the answers is bringing together these different normative frameworks. Um, one thing though I'd like to say is an interesting strength on IHL is that in the last few decades, whilst we haven't seen changes to the norms themselves, the 1949 Geneva Conventions and 1977 Additional Protocols, which are both uh, documents like most things are of their time, we've seen a lot of work around these treaties to be able to advance further in what I would call the Women, Peace and Security Discourse. So of course you've seen international criminal law with not just the statutes but the really interesting and important a jurisprudence that's come out which identifies things that years ago we're arguing about are now clearly non-controversial precedents. But you've also seen, I think, a, a lot of research and a lot of excellent work being done to really surface up the fact that armed conflict is a gendered experience. It is experienced differently by men, by women, by, um, by all sorts of people. You cannot apply the experience of sadly either being a, a being part of armed conflict or being involved in it in one way. So I think one thing is we're no longer stuck back in 1949 and 1977, and we've be, been able to make a number of progressions. One of the things I just wanted to flag briefly was um, one of the processes the ICRC has been working on that perhaps we could work more closely together, which is the updating to the commentaries to the Geneva Conventions, a big project. 50 years ago, the commentaries were written. Uh, and I just wanted to give three examples where I think this is quite important and we need to perhaps move together. The first one is that in updating the commentaries, we've been able to look at the principle of non-adverse distinction based on sex, which is a primary element within the um, IHL framework, that it is actually a, a requirement that is about um, substantive, not formal equality. And this is quite critical, I think, in an interpretation of IHL. So I think that's one really interesting update. The second is that I think we need to start, and we have through the commentaries, looking at sexual violence during times of armed conflict, not through the, the prism, I would say, of honour, traditional old-fashioned terms, which in a, in a very complex way often has a lot of traction in the field when we're dealing with non-state armed groups and others but we need to take this concept of the prohibition against sexual violence which we've done in the updated commentaries and move it beyond it being an experience of just women we know I think as you've clearly articulated it's sadly a non-discriminatory experience that's experienced by women and girls men and boys sexual violence but I think one of the updatings in the commentaries has really shifted this debate we're not going to address it and have any type of peace and security unless we look at the 
that issue. And the third is, I think um, what we've done in the countries is weave through gender perspectives, and you highlighted it beautifully, that the laws of war is not just about protecting women who are mothers or, or pregnant. There's a lot we need to analyze around the conduct of hostilities, distinction, proportionality, all these critical um, principles in IHL need to have a gendered aspect to them. And certainly in the updating of the commentaries, um, looking at obligations such as to treat uh, prisoners according to their sex. What does that mean today in a modern environment? Um, and the third um, element I wanted to flag, or second, second strength, so to speak, is the um, eye chilling action. And I think this is, and I'm sure you've factored in, I, I can't wait to read your full report. I think it's very important that we both uh, look at blind spots and things that aren't working, but we also look at things that are working because lots of people spend a lot of time saying IHL every day is breached. But prevention, which this normative framework tries to do, is known only in its breaches, it's not in its adherences to. And being part of the ICRC and having um, over 100 lawyers globally working on this in war zones, we see every single day when women's lives are saved, where they get access to medical treatment through checkpoints, where they're visited and detained. So I think we also need to constantly confidence build in the system. Otherwise, all of us and the Red Cross, uh, international organisations, researchers, spend the whole time almost debunking the law by saying how much it doesn't work and I think one of the things we've done for example is had eye chilling action where we found examples where the law of war does work and it, it you know it, it it provides the evidence that actually this is something we should invest time in so the two areas I think we can interconnect more closely together uh, one relates as I mentioned to perhaps looking at how we can ensure that we have both a uh, a highlight and a spotlight where things don't work, where there are blind spots, and whether these blind spots are actually um, more unseen spots where in fact the better coordination between normative frameworks could provide a stronger protection. Because in our views, there's a, a lot of tools we have at our disposal and working to make sure there's a political will, the understanding and the excellent research that you've got um, going forward is perhaps sometimes more useful than creating more tools. Um, I, I think that we need to look at the issue about women's participation in armed conflicts. Thank you for raising that. We've done quite a lot of work on the protections accorded to prisoners of war who are females, the protections accorded to women who are serving in the armed forces. It's often not highlighted enough, but it's a critical area. So I think we have some synergies in that. And finally, uh, as I said at the start, clearly IHL requires a nexus with armed conflict. Um, and it doesn't deal with many of the issues, um, intimate partner, the violence, certain types of uh, GBV, but I think that's where we need to look at the strong complementarity and weave together this narrative of how we can push forward and put pressure on those who are in positions. And we're also very interested in non-state armed groups. We engage with over 400 non-state armed groups globally on issues relating to protection. So I think um, our estimate is that 66 million individuals are under the control of non-state armed groups and they are a party to the conflict and IHL binds them, unlike human rights law, but we can talk about that later, some of the differences. I, I think we need to also, if we wanna make a difference to women's lives, also look carefully, and we do a lot of research with those who are non-state armed groups as well. So in summary, thank you. This is exciting. We have frameworks, we have synergies, we have differences, uh, we've got tools. There's a lot more work we need to do, but we also need to look at both the, basically both the stick and the carrot, how, how we actually push harder, and this is through prosecution, through awareness raising, but also how we find things that have worked and profile them forward. So that's all in relation to that question. Thank you. Great, thanks, Helen. I mean, I think that underlining the importance, the daily importance of the way in which IHL makes a difference is an important um, theme to underline and the theme also of complementarities as well as synergies. Um, so, so that's great. Let me just turn now to another Australian, uh, Dr. Katrina Lee Koo, who's Associate Professor of Politics um, and International Relations at Monash University, joining us at 2 a.m. or I guess 2.45 a.m. by now. Uh, so we're very grateful uh, to you, Katrina. Um, Katrina is also Deputy Director of Monash's uh, Gender, Peace and Security Research Centre. It's a centre with which uh, we at um, Georgetown collaborate closely as part of a consortium, global consortium 
of research centres focused on women, peace and security. Um, Dr Lee Koo's research has investigated gender after conflict and women's uh, leadership and inclusion uh, and the gendered politics of armed conflict. Uh, she's also an associate editor of the International Feminist Journal of Politics. So it's great to have Katrina with us here today. Um, Katrina, what I wanted to ask, you know, to stimulate your remarks is to relate the pioneering work that you've done at Monash uh, on institutionalizing WPS and women's leadership and what you see as being the key ways in which IHL could help to advance the broader direct objectives of the WPS agenda? And have you seen these in practice in your work in the field? Uh, so over to you, Katrina. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to participate in this discussion. Um, so drawing from the fine work that uh, Orly outlined in the report, I'd like to talk about two issues um, uh, of the research that the centre has been doing that fall uh, under the protection pillar and, of course, under the particip participation pillars that Orly talked about in her presentation. So the first one uh, is the opportunity, I think, that the two agendas offer in concert to think more carefully about the and girls that is frequently referenced under the WPS uh, protection pillar. So we're all familiar with the WPS resolutions. Uh, when it speaks particularly about the, participation, uh, the protection pillar, it often talks about the need to protect women and girls. But of course, as the report notes, and as Ollie outlined, while IHL sets out protection for children, it doesn't explicitly differentiate between boys and girls. Meanwhile, as the report also notes, WPS has the capacity to think critically and intersectionally about gender, but it often doesn't think in careful ways about children or about age. So in my research, when I've done some tracing of the women and girls in both the WPS resolutions and how that works in things like national action plans and implementation strategies, I found that ultimately there's been little sophistication in thinking about what it means to bring a gender lens to the protection of girls in conflict. So on the one hand, we've got IHL, which talks explicitly about the protection of children, but not necessarily bringing a gender lens. And we've got WPS, which talks about girls, but doesn't necessarily think in a sophisticated way about that. And this, I think, is, is becoming an increasingly sort of prevalent and, um, and well-recognised issue. For example, the Human Rights Council recently reminded us that in conflict-affected zones, the rates of, of child marriage absolutely skyrocket, uh, not just in conflict-affected zones, but also in all humanitarian contexts. And this is an issue which uniquely affects girls. Similarly, if we think about the raft of issues that are covered both under IHL and WPS, issues about vulnerability to sexual violence, issues around abduction, forced and voluntary recruitment, trafficking, access to humanitarian resources, including education, children who are orphaned or separated from their parents, children who are detained or interned, uh, children who take place in hostilities, all of these issues are shaped by the intersection of both age and childhood and, of course, gender. So I think there is one opportunity here for the two agendas to work much better together, to articulate and respond to the gendered natures of this issue. So that's one issue that came to mind when I was reading the, research, uh, the researchers' findings around <clears throat> intersections on the protection pillar. But moving to the participation pillar, I'll raise a second issue of, of um, research that I, I've been doing. So as a report notes, uh, women's participation in political decision-making, and I would add decision-making by men and women that is informed by gender awareness and gender sensitivity may have the capacity to influence and strengthen IHL compliance. So here I'll talk briefly about some research that I'm doing in the centre with the Australian Department of Defence on military gender advisors. So as of this year, Australia has tra uh, trained over 300 military advisors. They work on overseas deployments, but they also mostly work within Australia and they do things like inform military operations and practices. And this includes everything from actual military activities or, or um, engagement in hostilities, as well as um, um, humanitarian and disaster relief. So bushfire responses, natural disasters within the region, uh, and more recently, of course, COVID responses. 
So our research to date shows that the gender advisors within the Australian Defence Force do a number of things. They conduct gender analyses of situations. They have some authority to amend or advise on the operational doctrine and of the operational materials um, that, are, that are given to personnel to include things like a gender consideration. But also they're more willing to act generally as gender advocates within the organisation. And we've found that their role has seen greater engagement with women's civil society um, they've given greater attention to the issues of around what women and men's gendered roles are, what the assumptions about gender are, and what the experiences of civilian communities are in the places in which they operate, whether it's responding to bushfires in New South Wales or Victoria within Australia or um, in, in the region and overseas. So this research is very early, but we're finding that there are still, of course, um, attitudinal, structural and resourcing roadblocks for the Gender Advisors Program, foremost amongst which are, of course, recent reports into war crimes committed by the Australian Defence Force in Afghanistan. But we're also seeing some emerging evidence of the program's ability to answer the so what question for many in defence. So that is the question regarding why would we um, include a gender um, responsive approach um, to our operations. And here we're seeing evidence that some have been allowed or some have allowed themselves to be persuaded by the strengthening evidence that the inclusion of gender and of WPS perspectives and of diversity in decision making more broadly can enhance both soft and hard operational outcomes, which Orly also talked about in her presentation. So in short, we're seeing some evidence that IHL and WPS advocates can work together to build a culture that sees both material and operational as well as ide ideational value in compliance. So I think these are just two areas uh, where we're seeing a possibility for the um, combining of, of IHL and WPS um, as we move into the future. And I'll leave it there for the moment. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Katrina. And it's also fascinating to hear about the, uh, the increasing gender focus in the uh, Australian Armed Forces. Now I'd like to turn to someone from the UN system uh, to reflect on key implications uh, for multilateralism. Emily Kenny is a policy specialist at UN Women, which of course has the lead uh, at, within the UN system. Uh, and she works on women's access to justice in conflict affected countries and accountability for conflict related sexual and gender based violence. Her previous experience includes work with the Open Society Justice Initiative and the International Criminal Court. Uh, Emily has a JD uh, from NYU and an MPhil uh, from Cape Town. So circling back to uh, South Africa again. Um, Emily, UN Women plays the central role at the United Nations and in the overall multilateral system to advance gender equality. How do you see the value added of these preliminary findings? And what do you see as the key potential ways in which international humanitarian law could advance the global gender equality agenda? And what's the role of the UN uh, and the Security Council? Major questions, I know, but uh, it'd be great to get your reflections uh, from New York. Thank you. I'll give it a shot. Thanks very much, Dr. Klugman. And um, thank you to the Georgetown Institute and Liechtenstein for hosting this event. Um, Orly, thank you so much also for that fantastic presentation. Um, I do think that the report is really very useful at pointing out um, concrete areas where IHL and WPS work in synergy and where we can do more to leverage them together to advance both causes. Um, I also agree with the reports finding that the nexus between IHL and WPS is underexplored. Um, but I think sometimes we are working at the intersection of these issues at the UN. It's just that we don't realize it, don't connect the dots, and then we miss an opportunity to reach a broader audience and enhance the impact of our work. I'll share three things that are happening at the UN at the intersection of IHL and WPS as examples, um, and also talk a little bit about how we can deepen our work in these areas. So the first one is around the recommendation in the report to leverage the participation pillar of the WPS agenda to increase the number of women in the military, including in leadership roles to improve decision-making and enhance compliance with IHL. So um, as the report notes, states are making extremely slow progress on participation of women in the military. And this has direct implications for the UN's efforts 
to reach our own gender parity goals in peace operations. In peace operations as of May 2020, 5.4% of the military and 15.1% of the police were women. This is compared to 3.3 and 10.2% respectively in 2015. So we have an improvement, but from a very low bar um, and it's entirely insufficient to meet the UN's parity goals. So to respond to this problem, a group of states led by Canada have formed the ELSI Initiative Fund. The fund is designed to support and incentivize the increased participation of uniformed women, both military and police, who deploy in UN peace operations. The fund offers assistance to troop and police contributing countries to tackle the structural barriers to gender equality within their uniform services. UN Women host the secretariat of the fund, and we hope that more states, foundations, and NGOs will join the fund's efforts. And I really look forward to um, the research um, that Orly and others will be undertaking, showing um, that women's participation in uniform services leads to better outcomes. Um, and I think I can probably drop the link to um, the fund's website in the chat box. It's lcfund.org for those who are um, looking to learn more. So second, is another recommendation, is the other recommendation of the, re around, uh, of the report around the use of IHL to improve women's participation in armed, con uh, sorry, women's, women's protection in armed conflict. There are lots of P's in the WPS agenda. Um, so to use IHL to improve women's protection in armed conflict beyond the current focus on conflict-related sexual violence. All IHL violations have direct and indirect impacts on women and girls that are deeply gendered, and the UN is documenting these efforts, these, these effects. UN Women deploys gender advisors to all UN mandated commissions of inquiry in partnership with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and Justice Rapid Response. In the last four years, 38 UN Women experts contributed to UN investigations in nine countries, documenting IHL violations when relevant. For example, in June 2020, the Syria Commission of Inquiry reported that the civilian population in Idlib had been subjected to indiscriminate attacks on civilian areas and deliberate attacks on protected objects, killing and injuring thousands of civilians amounting to war crimes. The commission found that, quote, gender roles and the inequalities that underpin them fueled and amplified the impact of these violations, inflicting multifaceted harms upon survivors and shaping their negative experiences. So we have evidence of the gendered impact of IHL violations, but we can and should do more to link the UN's investigations, with, which often center around the Human Rights Council in Geneva, as Dr. Liku mentioned, some of their, their interest in um, women's rights in conflict countries. Um, we should do more to link the work in the Human Rights Council with decision-making in New York on WPS. One way to do this is through the Security Council Informal Experts Group on WPS. UN Women hosts the Secretariat for the IEG and prepares its briefings. We did a quick review of IEG briefing papers for today and found that IHL issues were sometimes included, particularly references to women in peacekeeping and conflict-related sexual violence as a war crime. But hopefully we can deepen our attention to the gendered impact of IHL violations uh, in the Security Council experts group in the future. And third, I'll finish by highlighting one last important intersection between WPS and IHL, the prevention of armed conflict. The WPS agenda is first and foremost, a feminist anti-militarist peace agenda. The best way to prevent violations of IHL is to prevent conflict. And one of the most effective ways to do that is to invest in gender equality and in women peace builders. Yet in 2018, the share of bilateral aid dedicated to gender equality was 4.5% of the total aid, a far cry from the goal of 15% set by the Secretary General for 2030. And the share of bilateral aid to women's organizations in fragile or conflict affected countries stagnated at 0.2% of the total. UN Women and our partners are working to address this funding gap in a number of ways, including through the Women's Peace and Humanitarian Fund where 100% of funds support women working on the front lines to build peace and resilience to crisis. There are many other organizations working on addressing the funding gap for women peace builders. And in fact, a great report was launched just last week on this topic by GAPS and Safer World um, and a number of uh, NGOs in conflict affected countries with eight very concrete recommendations on how to fund women peace builders. Uh, but suffice it to say that women peace builders are the visionaries behind the WPS agenda 
and they imagine a day where no IHL violations exist because there is no armed conflict, and we owe it to them to support their work. So with these three examples on participation, protection, and prevention, I hope it's clear that the UN is working at the intersection of IHL and WPS, but that there is so much more that we can and should do. And I think the report is really great at pointing out where we can do more. Um, and it also just will help us, I think, to conceptualize our work, whether we're primarily focused on WPS or on IHL, as reinforcing the other area. Um, and when we reinforce the other area and we speak to that broader audience, we can better reinforce the gains that we have made toward a more peaceful and equal world. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Emily. And it's so um, nice to hear that um, the work, the research may be useful in practice for uh, the important work that you do um, in the UN system. But finally, but not least, uh, we turn to Zoe Bedell. We were very happy again to have uh, Zoe join us because she uh, is unique among the panelists in bringing extensive military field experience as a captain in the US uh, Marine Corps Reserve. Uh, she deployed twice to Afghanistan, uh, where she served as officer in charge of uh, female engagement teams. Um, and then following her deployment, uh, she did her JD at Harvard and clerked uh, for Justice Kagan on the US Supreme Court uh, and for then Judge uh, Brett Kavanaugh uh, of the US Court of Appeals. She now works as an attorney in private practice. Um, but Zoe, we were very uh, keen to hear from you as someone with deep experience, both on the ground in terms of US involvement in Afghanistan, as well as your legal expertise. And to uh, hear your reflections on the interplay of IHL and WPS, and whether you see useful lessons that could be taken to influence the behavior and decisions of national militaries like the US Armed Forces. Zoe, over to you. Thank you so much for having me. And I've been so excited to hear about all of the enthusiasm for IHL and for women, peace and security. Uh, and unfortunately, I think a little bit my message here is going to be a little bit of you know, pushback on some of this and some of this enthusiasm. So to provide a little bit more context, let me provide a little bit of insight into what I was doing on the ground as the head of the female engagement team. This was a mission I engaged in on both of my deployments. And what we did was we took female Marines, uh, often from, from random jobs. I had admin sergeants, I had chemical weapons specialists, I had supply Marines, and we put them out with infantry Marines and had them engage with Afghans, both men and women. So my perspective is very much one of very much on the ground, working with infantry Marines um, of all ranks, but generally on the more junior side. I was not working with generals every day. I was more likely to be working with corporals and sergeants and maybe a battalion commander or another captain. Um, and I was a relatively junior officer. So again, that perspective of working very much like where the sort of foreign military meets the, the foreign nationals um, on the ground rather than in these sort of bigger spheres where I think, frankly, the sort of value of IHL and the value of women, peace and security are taken as an assumption and a baseline that is not necessarily shared from the perspective on the ground. So one thing that can illustrate the potential here is actually the founding story of the female engagement team. And this might be an apocryphal story at this point, but it's still helpful. So the way this program originally got started was apparently uh, a group of Marines had engaged in a firefight with various members of the Taliban. They chased them into a town and they went into a building. And so the Marines surrounded the building and were preparing to clear it. But before they could go in, they needed to clear the women and children out of the building to protect, protect civilian civilians. Uh, so the, you know, they, they ushered the women and children out and then they went in for their combat mission. And there was no one inside the building. And it turns out that all of the, um, the combatants had put on burqas, had covered themselves, had looked like women because you know, you're just sort of shapeless blobs a little bit and had run out within, with the women and, women and children. And so the Marines on the ground were frustrated and said, well, you know what, this wouldn't have happened if we could have searched the women. But they had been trained that you can't touch the women, you can't talk to the women in Afghanistan as men. And so they needed to bring in female Marines to conduct that security mission. 
So that's very much in some ways the intersection of IHL and women, peace and security. Uh, you have a need to, to distinguish or distinct, um, distinguish between civilians and combatants. Um, and you have the need to bring in women and bring them in from wherever they could find them. And if there had been more of them, it would have been easier, right? Um, but it also highlights uh, some of the challenges here. So first of all, IHL is a constraint, and we talked about this, and I think people uh, often on the civilian side view that as a good thing. And certainly there is an appreciation in the military for that these are some of our key values, and it's important to respect this and integrate it into our practices. But we do have to fundamentally understand that it is a constraint. Therefore, it is not necessarily always going to be viewed positively. And because it is a constraint, it is something the enemy can use against us, as they did in that case, and will further enhance this sense that it is a negative and it is tying our hands. Similarly, think of the words women, peace, and security. Peace and security are not what the Marine Corps in particular, but on the ground junior Marines or soldiers are interested in. That might be the end goal, but it's the end goal that means they get to go home. It's not what they're you know, excited about achieving. Th these are our people who have joined the military to fight because that is the military's ultimate mission. And then you loop, loop women in with these things that are in some ways lesser. And now you have this sort of body that is, ugh, I guess we'll deal with it. but. Um, it's not, it's not, no one's excited about it necessarily as such in the way that people who have devoted their careers to studying gender issues in, in the military or in conflict or in peace and security, that, that same sort of enthusiasm is not shared. So to the extent that there's a recommendation here, I think it is really to be focused on how both of these bodies can help further the mission of the military. And again, that, that, that is a, that's a very specific you know, outcome that's a very specific target audience. It can be talked about different ways at different levels. But when you are taking this to the ground and to the people who are going to be responsible for implementing both IHL and the uh, WPS agenda, I think it's really important to keep in mind what people are hearing. And that was how we were effective, was when we came and uh, pitched ourselves as how we could accomplish these, how we could help these infantry units accomplish their mission. So, I can, I can provide security. I can help make sure that the Taliban doesn't escape. I can talk to the women. I can help ask the women, where are the bombs hidden? Who are the threats to your community? And they know what's going on in their community, but men can't talk to them. And that was in a particular cultural landscape of Afghanistan, but there's there's a lot of different uh, cultures where you know women might not have you know, it, it, you can't send men to question the women or where uh, men would be limited in their ability to conduct those sorts of missions. Uh, but it also does highlight that IHL is sort of a, maybe it's the way that women can get in, uh, but there's a whole lot more that that the women peace and security agenda can be doing. Uh, but again. No one brought no one brought female Marines onto the battlefield because this you know it's equality or you know participation has some inherent value. It was because it helped achieve the mission, and I think keeping that in mind is a really helpful way to think about um, going forward here. Uh, the other thing I will say is that there is some inherent tension between participation and uh, protection. Um, you know, from the U.S. military side, I think we're often very focused on participation, um, but we the I, and I, I have sued the Department of Defense asking for the right to have women serve in combat jobs. That is a participation issue. But when you switch, and one of the one of the things that is used against me is like, oh, but women women don't know how to fight, and you know men will just want to protect them. And so, to the extent that the WPS agenda and and IHL both focus on women as people who need additional protection, additional assistance, uh, to the extent they're lumped with children, right? Those are those are negative associations, frankly, that hurt some of the participation agenda. So again, I, I, I share the enthusiasm and I know that um, a lot of people have devoted a lot of their careers to, to, to furthering that, which I really appreciate because I know it has helped those of us who are working on the ground. Uh, but, but I think we, I want to challenge some of the assumptions that everyone necessarily views all of these things as positive and, and as an automatic good. So I'll stop there. It's a little bit of a, maybe a little bit of a downer or a counterpoint, but hopefully an additional helpful perspective. Thanks, Zoe, uh, for that uh, real politic. Um, 
and you know, I think very useful for us to reflect on as well. Unfortunately, we're kind of running short on time. We've had a, um, a whole range of very interesting questions that were submitted both in advance and then in the, um, uh, in the Q and A function. Um, and I might just pick one of those now um, and actually come back to, to Helen, uh, because I think it relates to kind of a recurring theme, um, which has emerged both in the questions, but also in the discussion about the tensions in international humanitarian law and the political tensions, if you like, uh, between the humanitarian principles of neutrality and impartiality. Uh, and on the other hand, the need to be politically clear about non-negotiable human rights um, and important norms around women's inclusion. Uh, and that, there was a question that came uh, from Tazil Moore uh, from Care International, which I think put that quite well. And I wanted to just come back to Helen um, and to others if they would like to, to reflect on that one. Helen? Thank you very much. I think we're getting to the heart of the debate now and I've really enjoyed all the different speakers. May I just start by saying I agree with you, Zoe, we have to look at the mission and mandate critical issue. I mean, I've got an armed forces delegate in my department and um, they're all former colonels uh, from across the world and they will go out and explain IHL not about through the prism of humanity, but through the prism of how it uh, is a force multiplier in relation to mission and mandate. But I also just wanted to flag, and this is critical to the women, peace and security debate in IHL, IHL can either be framed as, as limiting or as permissive. I mean, IHL does allow killing certain categories with impunity. It does allow the locking up of individuals, prisoners, without having prosecution. So it depends the entry point um, of whether it's something that actually allows legitimate use of force or actually is um, a limitation on how you use that force. So there's a whole debate there, but I think it's critical. And these are the sort of debates we need to have in the women, peace and security space. We need to start looking at some of these debates about how those we're trying to influence understand and connect with these issues. I think the question you asked me, Jenny, or who was asked by others is I think one of the really deep hearts of how we need to move forward together. And I hopefully I addressed it maybe too subtly in my introduction, um, which is about, it's about complementarity. It's not about merging. It's not, I mean, human rights in IHL, we know the threshold applicability. We know the jurisprudence from the tribunals. We can discuss that. But at the end of the day, if we start mixing up human rights in IHL, it is dangerous for the framework, for the protections. What I think we need to do is bring into, we use the example, and thank you, Ollie, it was beautiful, when the military is used for more like a law enforcement paradigm rather than the IHL paradigm. You cannot apply an IHL paradigm in times of peace um, or the lower threshold because then you allow killing with impunity, which a law enforcement paradigm doesn't allow. So I have a couple of things in this question. It's the right question to ask. How can we keep the individual integrity of the different legal frameworks that were created for different purposes with different stakeholders at the case? How can we not merge them, not try and bring them upon each other so we actually end up alienating the military? If I, you know, of course the military goes with, and Zoe knows this and others more than anyone, with a paradigm that includes human rights. But if you're under a particular conduct of hostilities context, your uh, rules of engagement are IHL. If we start mixing the two, human rights, IHL development, we're going to end up with, I think, a, a lowering of the existing normative standards that we've all worked hundreds of years to put ahead. So I think we need to keep, if I look at the mandate of the ICRC, we need to keep our mandate clean around IHL, but look at where we can engage in human rights appropriately. We need to make sure that the emergency takes into account the wider development discourse. And obviously women's peace and security is a much wider discourse that goes way beyond the paradigm of IHL. But what I was so excited, and I think, so we can, we can be cautiously excited. Um, we need to start talking to each other more. We need to start understanding each other more. We need to make sure that it is applicable to the reality, the harsh reality of the conflict environment. But we, we certainly need to find these points where we connect more together. So I, I don't hope that answers the question. It's, it's a, you know, a topic for a seminar in and of itself, but it's really at the heart, how do we move forward with integrity to increase the protections and not mix up the paradigms? Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Um, any final reflections uh, from our other panelists? I know that we're, we're at time now. <laughs> 
Okay. Well, let me just uh, thank uh, heartily uh, our panel uh, for the for the insights and, and the range of contributions. And I think I'm feeling now we need to go back and rewrite our research paper, but it's already written, so we need to do another, uh, to um, you know to continue to advance uh, the agenda because it's clearly something um, which is very live and active. Um, and there's, whilst there's a diversity of kind of stakeholders um, and activists involved, I think there's also important commonality in objectives uh, and working out ways in which um, we can not only intellectually, but I think in practical terms, uh, provide support to accelerate progress uh, on those goals um, is very important. Um, and of course, I'd like to thank again uh, the government of Liechtenstein uh, for support um, because that's enabled this research and will enable us to continue um, uh, over 2021 to help to uh, advance the work. Uh, but thank you all for joining. Um, it was great to see so much interest and participation um, and the recording will be posted on our website together with um, uh, the various uh, research uh, which has been mentioned. So thanks again, see you.